name is Okistan Mushak Toye. I am a cadre organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. I'm also on the editorial team of Hood Communists, which is a revolutionary and African blog project that we do in coalition with several other African organizations like the Black Alliance for Peace and the UDO People's Progress Party. And I also serve on the National Coordinating Committee of the Ben Samuels Brigade, which is the oldest Cuba solidarity delegation in the U.S. But today, I'm going to be speaking to y'all in the capacity of an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, my main political homes. So, some things to know about me. I am an African woman resisting capitalism and imperialism and living in the United States. The boat dropped my ancestors off in Haiti and Honduras, but I am an African woman, period. I'm a Kumis Therese Cabrales cadre, a revolutionary pan-African socialist. depends on resources. 
resources stolen from Africa. The only way that global capitalism functions as the global economic system is by stealing from Africa. The way that capitalism spread across the world was by enslaving, kidnapping, and enslaving African people and forcing them to work to build the capitalist states. The reason why the US, the nations of Europe, and Israel are so-called superpowers is because they are built with wealth that was stolen from Africa. So understand that this entire globe, this entire economic system that we are forced to live under of capitalism and imperialism could not function without living off of the back of Africa, period. We also see all over the world that African people tend to be exploited, tend to be dehumanized, tend to be criminalized, tend to live in poverty, despite the fact that we come from the most resource-rich, the most wealthy landmass on the face of the planet. And the reason for that, again, is because our wealth, our land, our resources are being stolen by the global capitalist system. So revolutionary pan-Africanism has the objective of one unified socialist Africa because we believe the wealth, land, and resources of Africa should be under the collective and democratic control of African people, period. And the reason why that needs to happen under a socialist system is because, again, the capitalist system depends on the exploitation of resources. The capitalist system depends on the exploitation of labor. The capitalist system is destroying the planet we need to live on. It is causing genocide. It is causing war. It is not a solution to the problems of Africa and African people. Capitalism is the reason why Africa is exploited. Capitalism could never mean any kind of liberation for Africa and Africans. Socialism means that we collectively and democratically control our wealth, our land, our resources. Socialism is capitalism's antithesis. And so that is why we say our objective is the political objective of one pan-Africanism, which is one unified socialist Africa. So within the system of capitalism and imperialism, as I already mentioned, we are also living within a patriarchal society. It is capitalism and imperialism that makes patriarchy systemic. It is capitalism and imperialism that makes patriarchy so destructive. So within a capitalist and imperialist system, we as African women are triply oppressed. When I say that we are triply oppressed, I mean that African women are oppressed on the basis of our nation as being Africans, oppressed on the basis of our gender as being women, and oppressed on the basis of our class as being poor and working class African people within a capitalist system. So a patriarchal society is a society in which men have economic, political, social, and religious control. Within a patriarchal society, there are, of course, class contradictions. So the men that tend to have the most power tend to be European, petty bourgeois or bourgeois, meaning upper class, wealthy men. But even within that class contradiction, it is true that among the poor and working class, men still have that social, political, and economic domination. For a very small portion of the population, the ruling class, the so-called 1%, and the majority of us are living under exploitation, are living under poverty. So within that system of capitalism and imperialism, under the patriarchy that is systemic, African women are oppressed on the basis of our nation, on the basis of our class, and on the basis of our gender. They want to give some specific examples of what that looks like. So what does triple oppression look like in the day to day? It looks like a lot of what Inem described in that excellent video, but in detail, it means that African women around the world, particularly in the continent, and in the nations of the global south are living in conditions of poverty, disposition with limited, limited opportunity for education and advancement. For example, my family is from Honduras, and in the village where my people grew up, the Garifuna people, the women oftentimes are pulled out of school at age 12 or younger and forced to work in the home while their brothers are forced to go to work or continue their education. That is the case in a lot of global south nations where the educational opportunities are typically reserved for men. And the women are expected to work in the home doing domestic work until they eventually are married off to their husband, where they are expected to keep the family, take care of the children, take care of the husband, do domestic work, but are not typically allowed into the workforce. If they are allowed into the workforce, they are put into precarious and exploitative employment, meaning that they are forced to do, um, for example, market work, where they are selling goods that they grow in, in markets for cash without any kind of long-term opportunity for employment, without any, any kind of like social net or, 
or benefits or what have you. Another example of what triple oppression of women looks like is what's known as the dual phenomenon of forced migration and migrant widows. So the reason why this is happening is because the global imperialist system, as we already established, is exploiting and looting from Africa. In order to engage in ethnic exploitation and looting of Africa and global South nations, they are constantly destabilizing those countries with invasions, with the overthrowing of governments, with campaigns of economic sanctions to cripple the economy, to plunge the populations into poverty. When uh, uh, democratically, democratic leaders that represent the people are elected, the US or Europe will oftentimes force them out and again create conditions of destabilization of mass violence. That's what we're seeing in the Congo, for example, right now. Uh, the Congo was colonized first by Belgium and then by a coalition of European powers for, for decades. They rose up Patrice Lumumba, they fought for their independence. Belgium and the United States and Britain assassinated Patrice Lumumba, plunged the Congo into chaos that the Congo has struggled to escape ever since. And now the situation in the Congo is a situation where there is a massive refugee crisis, where there is day-to-day -day systemic violence that is heavily targeted against women in the form of systematic rape, in the form of systematic exploitation. And so now the situation is that billions of people are forced to flee the Congo across the African continent and to the Western Hemisphere. That situation of forced migration unfolds all across the world under the system of capitalism and imperialism. It's very similar where my family comes from in Honduras. In Honduras, we uh, had a democratic election, elected a man named Manuel Zelaya, who was talking about nationalizing the resources, who was talking about uh, uh, building nationalized healthcare for the people living in Honduras so everybody would have access to healthcare and education. The United States was like, actually, we would like to keep looting Honduras at this time. We're going to get you out. They overthrew Manuel Zelaya, put in place a puppet leader that they controlled, plunged Honduras into chaos, and thousands of people had to flee the country to the U.S. border. When you hear about U.S. politicians talking about the so-called migration crisis, when they're talking about thousands of people from Africa, from Haiti, from Honduras, from all over the world, fleeing to the U.S. border, trying to get out, get in, and demonizing those people, they're talking about fleeing conditions that they themselves and the imperialist system have created. That is what I mean by forced migration. And it's oftentimes women and children and families that are forced to engage in that process because the conditions that imperialism has created in their home countries are unlivable. But the other side of that point of forced migration is what's known as migrant widows, right? Where oftentimes in global South nations and in African nations, African men will leave their families in search of employment overseas because they cannot find jobs where they are and so they have to leave to find employment to sustain themselves, to sustain their families. And so the women and the children are left behind and forced to survive on whatever the man is able to, to get, send back and also based on whatever the woman is able to, to generate with precarious employment, the men go live overseas and they send money back. Oftentimes, this is what my dad did, oftentimes the men will develop entire new families outside of the home country and then stop sending money back to their families back home, and that creates an even worse situation for the women and children who are left. So that's what we mean by migrant widows. Again, the conditions created by imperialism force people to flee, uh, flee their home territories. If it's the women and the children, they are put in a situation where they become refugees. If it's the men, it's similar, but again, the, the family back home is dependent on the resources sent back by the men, and sometimes that is cut off because of, you know, the situation of what happens when you build a new life in a new place. Some other examples of triple oppression are systemic sexual abuse and exploitation. There is a massive epidemic of sex trafficking in Africa and other global south nations where because of the conditions created by capitalism and imperialism, where women are forced to precarious employment, where they do not have you know, um, organized ways to advocate for their rights, where they do not have access to any kind of guarantees in terms of sustaining employment, they are forced in situations where they are forced to sell their bodies in order to sustain themselves in extremely exploitative conditions. Or where they are um, so victimized and so separated from any kind of community or infrastructure for justice that they are subject to sexual violence and there's very, very little recourse for this. And this is again true across the African continent, across the global south, 
Again, the example of the Congo, of systematic mass rape is a very common occurrence there. Rape as a tactic of terror, rape as a tactic of control is very, very common in the Congo. It's very, very common in areas that have been stabilized by imperialism. And this is something that women and children in particular are subjected to. Some other examples of what triple oppression looks like are objectification, dehumanization, criminalization, and colonial narratives that are used to justify patriarchal violence and capitalist domination and control. So the common stereotype of the African woman in the capitalist media, in the global north, is a woman who is, is, is uh, breeding too many children that she cannot take care of. This is Ama Atu Aju, who is the former Secretary of Education in Ghana, speaking at an international women's conference. She says, the image of the African woman in the mind of the world has been set. She is breeding too many women, she, children she cannot take care of, for whom she should not expect other people to pick up the tab. So the narrative of the African woman, which is again, the condition of African women has been created by the enemy, created by capitalism and imperialism. But the narrative of the African woman is that she's having too many kids, she's poor, she's uneducated, she expects people to take care of her with handouts. And again, this is a narrative that is created in response to conditions created by capitalism and imperialism. But they push out these stereotypes, these narratives, to begin to blame African women for our own condition. That is the entire point. This is what triple oppression looks like. It's creating systematic conditions that dehumanize, that exploit, that oppress, and it's creating narratives that blame us for the existence of those conditions. But it's very important to understand that African women are not helpless, African people are not helpless, despite the, the intent of this system to exploit, to dominate, to oppress, to loot from Africa, to loot from African people. There has never been a point in the history of imperialism, in the history of colonization, where African people have not struggled against these conditions, have not taken organized action to transform and to change the condition, including African women. So let's talk about some specific examples of how we have fought back. So, um, I would like to talk to y'all now about a revolutionary organization that still exists to this day, and that is the PIGC and its women's wing Udamu in Guinea-Bissau. So very important to understand, the APRP and the PIGC are the same organization. There are members of the PIGC on the Central Committee of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party. There are members of Udamu on the All-African Women's Revolutionary Union Council. If you are a member of the PIGC, you are automatically a member of the APRP. If you're a member of APRP, you are part of the PIGC, so we are one organization, so keep that in mind um, as I'm speaking. But the PIGC and Urumu helped lead the national liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau, which defeated Portuguese colonialism in that nation. They were uh, going up against not just Portugal, not just Portuguese colonialism, but Portugal backed by the forces of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, that was basically the combined military and political force of all the European nations led by the United States. So the PIDC and Udamu and the mass of people in Guinea-Bissau did not just beat Portugal, they beat basically the entire military might of the West when they won their national liberation struggle. So I want to read a quote by Amical Cabral, which talks about the very intentional and organized way that the PIDC and Udamu approached the question of the oppression of women within capitalism, imperialism, and patriarchy. So this is Amical Cabral, who's one of the founders of the PIDC. He says, some comrades do their utmost to prevent women taking charge. Even when there are women who have more ability to lead than they do, the men comrades, some do not understand that liberty for our people means women's liberation as well. Sovereignty for our people means that women as well must play a part, and the strength of our party is worth more if women join in as well to lead with the men. And that's again, Amakal Cabral, one of the founders of the PIGC in Guinea-Bissau, Talking about from the very beginning of the national liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau, the PIDC was intentional and systematic about including women within their work, about including the fight for the liberation of women from patriarchy as part and parcel of the struggle to defeat colonization and imperialism in Guinea-Bissau. So what this looked like in practice was intentional, widespread, organized recruitment and development of women in Guinea-Bissau, including into positions of political and military leadership. And this is something that was, was relatively uncommon in national liberation struggles in Africa at the time. For example, in Algeria, the FLN, which was the, the, the organization that helped lead the anti-colonial struggle against the French in 
Algeria, they integrated women into the liberation struggle, but the women typically played support roles. They were um, cooking, they were taking care of children, they were um, providing domestic duties for armed fighters, but they themselves were not engaged in the military struggle. And, uh, uh, and it was similar in, for example, in, the, in Mozambique with the MPLA. Um, so, in, in uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, and I also don't know what I just said about Mozambique is correct. So, but for the FLA, it was correct. But, um, in Guinea Bissau, they were like, we're not just going to have women in uh, support roles, we're not just going to have women cooking and cleaning, we are going to have women in political leadership. We're going to have women engaged in the armed struggle. We're going to have women generals. We're going to have women diplomats. They're going to be integrated in all aspects of the revolutionary struggle in Guinea Bissau. Women also were expected to actively participate in their struggle for liberation, meaning that the PIDC and UDMU understood that they would not, they could not expect the liberation of women to come just because men thought it was the right thing to do. Men were just not just going to go along with the program because it was the morally correct thing. They understood that women had to be organized and taking initiative, taking progressive action to win our liberation. It wasn't a matter of appealing to the better nature of men. It was a matter of educating and organizing women to build women's organizations that can force the changes that need to happen in society in Guinea-Bissau to advance the liberation of women. So some areas, uh, so wherever the PIDC had control of a liberated territory, you saw reforms pushed again by the women in Udamu and the PIGC that transformed the conditions of women in those areas. For example, the PIGC fought hard for an end of ban on forced marriages of young women. And because the PIGC fought for that reform, again with the leadership of women within the organization, they endeared themselves to women, African women in Guinea Bissau, young women, who then went on to join the PIGC. So the PIGC started with a commitment to integrate the liberation of women into the national liberation struggle, they took concrete steps to recruit and educate African women. They expected African women to take leadership in our struggle for liberation, and they also took concrete steps to transform the conditions of women. They weren't just talking about it, they were about it. So the results of this very intentional strategy by the PIGC was the development and elevation of many revolutionary African women into political and military leadership within the PIGC. Women like Carmen Pereira, like Theodore Gomes, who's still alive, and one of the leaders of Udamu, and my favorite example, which is Tatina Silla. Tatina Silla was a very, very young woman. She was recruited into the PIDC when she was 18 years old, quite young. She was developed within the political education schools of the PIDC. She was sent to study in the USSR to learn about revolutionary socialist theory and about the armed struggle. And she came back and became a general within the armed liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau. She was assassinated by the Portuguese when she was, like, I believe, like 22 or 23 while she was traveling to Emma Carver Ball's uh, uh, funeral. But up until that point, from the age of 18 to her early 20s when she was killed by the colonizers, she was a leader, a respected leader of the mass movement in Guinea-Bissau. And it's very important to understand that Tatina Silla, Teodoro Gomes, Carmen Pereira, these were not outliers. They were, these were typical women within the PIGC, within Uru. Um, this past year, in 2023, the APRP had our very first party congress, which was hosted by the PIDC in Guinea-Bissau. And at that party congress, there were sisters in Udamu and in Jaffa, the women's wing of the APRP, like my comrade Deborah and my comrade Segunda, who were like 19, 20, 21, 22, who were running the meeting, who were strong voices in the room, who were facilitating political spaces alongside seizing Kaveh and Ben and the APRP, PIDC for decades. And I give that example to show you that people like Katina Cillian, who were recruited and developed so young by the PIDC, that phenomenon still exists in Guinea Bissau because of the foundation that was laid by this approach of the PIDC. The other thing that we should recognize about what was accomplished with the PIDC's very systematic and intentional approach to integrated women into the struggle for liberation in Guinea Bissau was that they concretely transformed the conditions of women that women themselves led that transformation. So that ban on forced marriages, a ban on female genital mutilation, the integration of women into positions of leadership, the representation of women within the state and within the PIDC as a revolutionary organization, these
These are all concrete transformations that are a direct result of the intentional and systematic approach that the PIDC took to integrate the liberation of women. And so the lesson from this history, from the PIDC, is that we can't just say that we oppose patriarchy. We can't just talk about being for the rights of women. We have to take concrete action to build the organization and political consciousness of women if we want to address patriarchy. That's the only way it's going to happen. It is women, African women, that are going to liberate African people and that are going to make our contribution to the liberation of Africa and the objective of Pan-Africanism. So let's talk about some specific lessons that we can take from the history of the PIGC and the uh, National Racial Struggle of Guinea-Bissau and how they integrated the liberation of women. Point blank, what is necessary for us to do today is to make an explicit commitment to advancing the liberation of women as part and parcel of the struggle to liberate Africa and African people. It can't be something that happens down the line. It can't be something that happens, you know, at some indeterminate point in the future when we accomplish our, our, our initial goals. No, it has to happen side by side. Just as we are fighting to liberate Africa's land, labor, and resources, we have to fight to liberate African women. They have to happen at the same time. And the liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau shows that this is possible and also necessary. Some ways to put this into practice, because again, it's not just enough to say that we want the liberation of women, we have to take action to fight for the liberation of women. We should build organizations of women and marginalized genders that are led by women and marginalized genders. At the beginning of the presentation, I talked about the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, which is the women's wing of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. That's quite a bit younger than the All African People's Revolutionary Party. The AWRU only exists because the women in the APRP fought for it to exist, demanded that it existed, and built it from the ground up. This is the kind of work that needs to happen. Build organizations of women that are led by women, that are working to develop women into conscious revolutionaries, that are fighting the internal and external struggle against patriarchy. The second very, very important part, our lesson that we can take from the example that we have to engage in comprehensive and systematic political education for all members of our movement, but particularly women. Under, because African women are typically oppressed, because we are typically locked out of access to educational advancement, that means that we have a responsibility within our revolutionary movements to engage in systematic political education, to develop our collective consciousness of who our enemy is, of how the enemy functions, and how we can take, take collective action against it. We cannot hope to fight colonialism, capitalism, imperialism, patriarchy if we don't understand how they actually work. Political education is how we understand how they were built and how they can be torn down. It is also a great equalizer because if everybody is forced to engage in this process of study, if we are all learning about socialism, imperialism, capitalism, patriarchy together, there isn't going to be a hierarchy of knowledge where the man who knows the most in the room is deferred to because no one else knows what he's talking about. If we're all reading the same books, that means we are all equal in that room in terms of what strategies are put forward, in terms of what steps we need to take next. Political education is a great equalizer. It's essential for any kind of organization, whether it be a social organization, whether it be a student organization, whether it be a social justice organization. I believe that political education is a key step in getting on the same page, and it is certainly a key into developing women in our movements into leaders, into revolutionaries. Another really important step to put a commitment to advancing the liberation of women into practice is to take vigorous and concrete internal and external struggle against patriarchy. One thing that is very, very common in the movement is that folks like to say that they're for the liberation of women, they oppose patriarchy, they oppose the oppression of women, but they just talk about it. They don't take any steps. They just say the right things. But when it comes to like actually putting it into practice, actually like allowing women to build organizations or supporting women building other organizations, not allowing, or taking concrete steps to develop African women into revolutionary leaders on a systematic basis, not just on tokens, they fall very, very, very short. And again, unless you have women's organizations led by women, unless you have political education that helps everybody understand what patriarchy is and what it looks like, you're not going to be able to have take those concrete steps. You're not going to be able to engage that struggle in the way that it needs to be engaged. So again, build organization of women and majors led by women and majors. Have comprehensive political education no matter what kind of organization you have. And also, once you have that foundation in place of 
organization and political education, you have to be relentless about struggling against patriarchy, both within your organization and outside of your organization. And of course, the prerequisite for any of this, for building a women's organization, for engaging in comprehensive PE, for engaging in internal and external struggle to advance liberation of women, is to join an organization. In this space, it's really remarkable because you all, I believe, are already active in African students' organizations. And that is not usually the case when we are presenting as a PRP. Usually we have to like convince, beg people, join an organization fighting for your people. Join an organization where you can work collectively to change the conditions that you see around you. The fact that the folks in this room are already active in organizations shows that you've already taken the most important step. And so building a women's organization Developing some kind of internal political education practice, like that is the next step for y'all. But for folks who are not active in organizations, if there's anyone in this room who's not active in an organization, join an organization fighting for justice, because none of the rest of this can be accomplished. Even the struggle to liberate our people from capitalism and imperialism cannot be accomplished unless we are active in organizations fighting for justice. So some calls to action specifically for the folks who are active in political organizations in the room is to institute a political education process for all of your members and learn more about the history I've talked about today, learn more about the history of anti-colonial struggle in Africa, both in, in the 20th century and what's happening today. Um, the NAM gave a really excellent primer on what's happening in Niger and how imperialism is responding and how the mass of people in, in Niger are responding. But understand the entire African continent is on fire right now. All kinds of people's movements are springing up in response to imperialist domination. The people of Africa have never sat still. We have always taken action to uh, transform our conditions. And in those actions, there are so many lessons that we can learn about how we need to build in our respective organizations. And the way that you can integrate those lessons, integrate those strategies, is by studying them in some kind of organized political education process. Even if you're not like a socialist organization, a revolutionary organization, you still should have some kind of practice of political education to have the same understanding of what the problem is that you're trying to address and what steps need to be taken to address that problem. Another concrete call to action for people who are active in organizations is to seriously consider starting an anti-patriarchy working group in your organization to analyze like, what is the current, uh, the state of the union, at the least, if you will, about what is like, the current situation with patriarchy in your organization, what are your successes, what are your shortcomings, what are the strategies that you're using to advance the struggle for women's liberation within your context. Like if you don't have a concrete understanding of the problem, how can you actually take steps to address it, right? And then the last thing, the last concrete suggestion, uh, uh, suggestion for organizations is to consider building a woman in major's wing of your organization if it doesn't already exist. Um, sometimes when women organize in this way, the pushback is that it's divisive, that we all have to be together, that like, women don't need their own spaces, and that is not true. I don't think anyone here would ever argue that African people do not need to have our own political spaces, our own political organizations, right? So if we understand that African people need to have our own political spaces, our own political organizations, then we have to understand that all people oppressed have a right to organizations to deal with their specific problems. African people and African women have specific conditions that we have to educate ourselves about and organize ourselves around, and that means that we need our own organization. The AWRU is part of the APRP, is an intrinsic part of the work of the APRP. We are not a separate organization, we are a sister uh, uh, within the All African People's Revolutionary Party, within the worldwide Pan African movement. It is not divisive, it is a necessary step to organize ourselves in the way we need to, to engage in the struggle for women's liberation. So if you don't have a women's wing in your organization, seriously consider creating one, creating that space where the women in your organization can come together and discuss their conditions, study their conditions, and develop a collective strategy to address those conditions. And so that concludes my presentation. I think we're gonna have questions and answers later, but up on the uh, screen, we have some QR codes where you can learn some more information about the APRP. So I'll start with, from the top left and then clockwise. So the QR code on the top left is if you wanna sign up to learn more about the All African Revolutionary Party, organize an info session, scan that top left QR code, and then moving right, learn about the APRP work study process. So I kept talking about political education, political education, political education. 
Within the All African People's Revolutionary Party, our political education process is what's known as work study. Every single member of the APRP all over the world, we have chapters in Africa, we have chapters in Europe, we have chapters all over the nation of the Western Hemisphere. Every single member of the APRP, no matter who they are, no matter how old they are, is required to participate in the work study process. We study about Africa, we study about socialism, we study about communism, we study about what's going on in the world today, and we use that as the basis to develop our revolutionary strategy for how to transform the conditions of African people and how to win pan-Africanism, one unified social society. So if you want to know more about how the APRP work study uh, process functions, or if you want to join a work study circle, then check out that QR code on the top right. And then on the bottom right, we have the APRP link tree. But I guess it's like assorted links to APRP related content, so check that out. And then on the bottom left, if you want some conscious Pan-African t-shirts, sweatshirts, art, then check out the Forward Ever Shop on Etsy for APRP gear. And then lastly, you can follow the All African People's Revolutionary Party on social media at APRP 